We'll okay. figure it out. We're live, Dennis. We are all the way live. <laughs> and we're having some technical difficulties, but we're going to try to... <laughs> we're going to work through live. these. Try to figure it out here. We're live um, now, but we're going to die soon. <laughs> that's the thing. That's the thing about this format, because we used to just... Everybody knew how to use a, you know, call people. That's what we did. We just called people on the phone. But now it's like... A lot of people aren't aren't hip to the. Have you done many of the live streams, Kevin? Before? No, I did one for uh, Billy Gallo. He has a podcast and YouTube channel, but he he records it and then airs it. You know, he doesn't do it live. So I did an interview with him. He just recorded it and then put it up like a few days later. Yeah, I mean, we could have done that in hindsight. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah. <you> know, <laughs> <laughs> So for, yeah. Okay, I'm going to the Bond film then. Fuck this. <laughs> <laughs> so at first, Dennis was working fine, and yeah. we couldn't get Kevin working. Now Kevin's working, and Dennis is, I don't know if it's his internet connection or what the deal is. but well, uh, I, I've noticed, like, before with my internet, the more people that got on this, the more it kind of got messed up. So that might be part of it. I don't know. But we're all the way live now, and we have some people in the chat already. Chris V, Scott's Wrestling Collection is always in here, it seems like. Faw's Rotten, looks like he's a big fan of uh, Night of the Demons, which I need to send you that song. You remember us telling you about that song that we did called Eat a Bowl of Fuck, I'm Here to Party? <laughs> yes. Long time ago. I've got yeah. it. I've got an MP3 of it now, so I'll, I'll email it to you. You'll probably be like, what in the hell is this? When you hear it, but, I'm sure. But what are you going to do? Um, but it's good to have you guys back. Well, you we've had Kevin on a couple of times before, years and years ago on the show. But, back when uh, I was relevant. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, what was it, 2000? Seven? Not 2000. It was a long time ago. I think you guys are the first podcast I ever did. You call, You somehow found my home phone and called me at home. And <laughs> yes, and, is this Kevin Tanny, the movie director? <laughs> you directed uh, the motion pictures. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like the back, moving pictures. Back then, like our first. That magic lantern. <laughs> <laughs> our uh, first website was like we did like through the mail autographs too. This before the show, and I think that's how we got your contact info. We would we would just be like PIs or something, <laughs> finding all these people. Yeah. So, um, no, they're called stalkers. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. Like these poor people, we did that to like a bunch of people, and I'm sure some of them really didn't appreciate it. But <laughs> it is what it is. But yeah, I think luckily I'm always a very lonely guy. Two thousand <laughs> yeah, two thousand seven, two thousand eight. We had you on a that couple a, of times. It was a long time ago. And around that time you were um the uh the zombie movie Brain Dead, right? Yeah. yeah that was I believe so. And look Dennis's picture is frozen now too. He's just like Yeah. Should he try to reboot his computer or what it, whatever he's using, he should definitely turn it off and turn it back on. I don't know, like how else, like what else would yeah. work. I'll send him a message on here and see if he can. Uh... <laughs> I think I mean, said that he came in here a little bit earlier, so yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I think it, it's just a connection issue, probably. That's what it looks like. It looks like it's the actual internet connection so i'm not but sure it's weird that it's weird that we lost him the minute we got me my sound up and running yep that is kind of odd <clears throat> scratch burno phantas matt so <laughs> i guess we can just talk about current stuff real quick um weren't you working on a movie with tiffany shabbos we were got, we were trying to get a sequel made to the uh, Night of the Demons remake, but um, the company that owned the rights to it 
had some legal issues and uh, it pretty much just got shut down. And that was the end of that. Legal wow. issues, I hate them. I thought it was, I wrote the name down here. I was looking on IMDb all day. That's how I do my research, by the way. Yeah. But it's not always accurate. Don't no. let them in with no. that, the sequel. They had they had me going to UCLA for the longest time. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure the faculty at UCLA was surprised to hear. <laughs> mm-hmm. and it's the internet. I mean, you can put pretty much. And the weird thing about IMDb is anybody can add stuff on there. It's like I Wikipedia. Know. Yeah. yeah, no. It. I. And that was it. It was some guy. I'd never met, I didn't know, wrote a biography of me and got all his facts wrong. And I went in and told them that. And they said, well, we won't, they wouldn't take it down. They said, you can write your own. So I did thinking it would replace his, but it just went under his. So when you go to my page, his review, his uh, biography pops up before the one I wrote. So it's like. <laughs> yeah. That's... So as far as. Um... Well, just we'll go back to the beginning, though. Okay. And I don't know if I don't know about Dennis. I, mean, I don't have much faith that he's going to get this working. I don't know what the deal is. <laughs> want, we should have faith in this. I feel like he's going to pull it out. Well, you know what? Um, he's the sound expert. He's the one that does music. He should. Uh, <laughs> well, that's he should what I was be. thinking. Yeah, he's he does all of his stuff on a computer anyway. So. Yeah, exactly. If I was him right now, unless he doesn't have a webcam on that computer behind him, I would just use that. Yeah, I'll try I that. That's what I would do too, but you know. But anyway, I'm not sure. Anyway, we digress. Yeah, <laughs> going back though to what was the what time frame are we looking at when you got into movies? What genre of movies? What films in particular got you? You know, really piqued your interest in filmmaking. I don't know. I just always liked it. Um, I do remember. Um, and I, I might have told you guys this story before in one of the other interviews we did, but basically, Bell and Hal. Came, up until then, you could make home movies with Super 8 cameras. No, no such thing as videotape yet, and they were just silent. You shot silent home movies, and I'm sure you've seen some from your parents or grandparents um, home movies. But when I was in sixth grade, Bell and Hal came out with a Super 8 camera that had a cord that would connect it to their cassette deck, tape, uh, audio cassette deck. And when you pull the trigger on the camera, the film would roll and the tape would roll and it would record sound. And the, the cord, the sync from the camera was keeping it in sync. There was a pulse from the camera to the tape recorder. Then when you got your film back, you you put it on the, um, you put it on the, uh, maybe he's rebooting now. Uh, you put it on the um, projector and you take that same cord and plug from the projector into the cassette and it would keep the playback of the tape in sync with the picture. So I begged my parents to get that for me. It was expensive. So it was basically my birthday, Christmas, Halloween, Thanksgiving, every present I was going to yeah. get for the next three years in that camera set. And I thought, I'm going to make an actual movie with my friends. So, you know, we're all sixth graders. So we put on our suits and I wrote a murder mystery. And we're all playing detectives and criminals and victims. And um, the problem was you had to shoot it in order. You had to get everything in the first take because you couldn't do a take two because you couldn't edit. Because if you cut the picture, it wouldn't stay in sync with the sound. So we got about halfway through the film before we blew it. So we stopped and I said, everyone go home and we'll do it again in a couple of weeks. A couple of weeks, everyone came back and we made it about two thirds of the way through. <laughs> and I said, screw it. I'm going to just make silent movies. So I did that. <laughs> I did that until they came up with Super 8 cameras that actually had a, a magnetic stripe on them. And then they were actually, the sound was recorded on the film. And then you could actually make it like a professional film except that I had, you know, no abilities in Super 8 and didn't know how to light. But I learned all that from doing. Don't, now, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, since Dennis is here with us in spirit, 
uh, right now and hopefully here with us physically soon. Like, where did he fit in, like, with all this at the time? I mean, was he well, a part uh, of it? Or? Yeah, he would He would act in my film. All my friends would, and we'd do silent films. And we did do, like, this big manhunt epic that was all silent and then just laid. We would show it and play music, I mixtape with it. Um, but once we had the sound, we could actually start shooting films. And then Dennis started, um, decided to try playing guitar like his sophomore year in high school. And a friend of ours who played showed him the notes and the chords. And he just was a natural at it. Within like a year, he could outplay all the people who'd been playing for years and who had taught him how to play. And after that, he started composing. So then when I was making my films, he would actually do a soundtrack which he'd have to plug into the projector and play along with the picture <laughs> and sync it up you know so there was no like he later we figured out how he could actually ah, ah, yeah oh, heard, i heard, heard you know, some yeah heard there we go for a beat. try talking again in real time yeah, yeah. all right we got you now real time we are all the way live your image is still freezing a little, but at least we can hear you now. So perfect, you That's came in just when. Uh, uh, fuck. Physical <laughs> problems. <Yeah. laughs> I want to turn your volume up a little bit too. Okay. See if I can do that. Yeah. Try not doing it on a flip phone. Me, I can't. <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> I, I got uh, an idea here. The angle's odd because I'm also using it as a doorstop. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> so we were just getting to the point where you were starting to do music for my Super 8, so perfect timing. Was it after the... Was that after the point where you threw me off roofs? Well, we all jumped off roofs. I mean, we did, we would do like, you know, movie, we liked action films. So we would do stunts and we would take our, one of our twin mattresses out in the backyard and jump off the roof onto the mattress. And then we <laughs> thought, oh, you know what? It, uh, put some, put the box springs under it and then it, it because it would still be kind of a hard landing, even though it was a mattress. So we put the box springs, but then you had to be careful because you'd jump, you'd hit the mattress and you'd bounce. And if you were disoriented, you yeah. wouldn't know where the ground was. So you might be going head first toward the ground, but you think you're going to land feet first. So instead of doing this, <laughs> you're like this, and then your head would go bang from the ground. So one thing I want to ask Kevin, though, because I've seen some of these old school pictures of you back in the day. Were you a rock and roller too? Because you kind of looked like it. You looked like you could at least play the bass or something, you know? Oh, really? <laughs> like you could yeah. at least play you the had, bass. You I, had well, that I, look, that classic, you know, bass, bassist look going on. You yeah, could totally yeah. get away with that. <laughs> yeah. I always say that the bassist obviously isn't that talented because he's got five <laughs> fingers and he only has to play four strings. The guitarist <laughs> has to play six with five fingers. So, you know. <laughs> Um, I played keyboard a little, and I mean very little, and, but I could sing. Kevin was so a lot of times I would, he did, you know, sing, but but never in a group like Dennis had all these different bands. I was never in a band. I, you know, a man has to know his limitations. <laughs> <laughs> so when so, does the the keyboards come into it? So he starts playing guitar. Mm -hmm. And at some point, like I'm imagining, like he has to learn keyboard. That's that's a pretty difficult thing to learn without any kind of training. Well, according to Dennis, can you hear? Or can we hear you yet, Dennis? Uh, okay. Well, according to Dennis, the keyboards once he once he mastered the guitar, the keyboards were actually college. not so hard. Hmm. the guitar. And Now he just has to master his telephone. The, the <laughs> instrument. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this that's sucks. the. This sucks. You guys have talked to me three or four the times. This is going to be your first been. time talking to Dennis. I know. There's only one place to play.
I th- I'm positive it's a connection issue. Yeah. I thought this would be amazing. <laughs> can, Dennis, can you use your laptop or computer back there to try to hook up instead of the phone? Because it seems um, like your, con- your, your um, connection is bad. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a connection issue, it looks like. Mine? Yeah. Who do I hear talking in the background? <laughs> it's probably, that, that's probably probably my children. Like teen, Aaron's like <laughs> teen kids. Do you have children? Yeah. Okay, okay. I just heard it and I thought the neighbor's kids are loud tonight. But then when I pulled <laughs> no, the no. off, but it, my my place is dead silent. <laughs> you'll know when my place becomes active, you'll start hearing dogs barking. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Hamrick on here while we're uh, trying to get this figured out. He wanted to tell you that he loves Night of the Demons and Witchboard, and he talks to you all the time on Facebook. You're pretty active on Facebook still. A lot of people have have deleted Facebook. They've they've done away with it, but you're still hanging in there. I'm hanging in there. I'm old school, baby. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I actually have an Instagram account because my daughter set it up for me, but I never go to it. <laughs> I... I, I don't understand really Instagram or Twitter that much, and I never well, have. Yeah. But. I know. I, I just, I, Facebook just feels comfortable. It feels like home. Yeah. Yeah. I really don't understand. The one that always gets me is TikTok. Like, I don't know what the hell's going on on TikTok. Like, My I feel wife like... just sits there and watches TikTok videos all day. <laughs> I don't, That's I don't understand. That's all Anything with a dog or a cat or something, she just... Uh, Phantasmat uh, recommends maybe resetting his Wi-Fi router. I don't know. I don't know. I'd give it a try. But, um, but then I try anyway, my, we'll, my computer didn't work, and I try everything. I plug everything. I plug it back in. I reboot the Wi-Fi, the router, the computer itself. And then I call for Amanda. <laughs> 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 Tenny Tech, Tenny Tech, come here. <laughs> so, do you remember you did the student film, right? I mean, that was the first actual, you know, professionally Correct. done movie. You mean USC student film? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Dennis did the score for both of them. <clears throat> right, kind of each of your debuts when it comes to professional filmmaking or whatever. Do you have any um, fond memories of making it at the time? Was it was it fun? Oh, absolutely. Is there any way anybody can can view the movie at this point? Because it won some awards, right? You won some War Games, which was my undergrad film, won an Emmy. Okay. Um, the Book of Joe, which is my graduate film, um, uh, got me the three picture deal with Ivan Reitman and an uh, office on the Columbia lot. And I was writing a script for Ivan while I was still a full-time student at USC. And Ivan Reitman, of course, is the producer-director of Ghostbusters. Um, What's that? Stri- Stripes. Uh, a bunch of comedies that were really popular at that time. When I was working for Ivan, Ghostbusters had just come out. And it, it, was, the num- it was the number one comedy sense. of all time. It finally got deposed or uh, knocked off its uh, throne by uh, Home Alone. Oh, uh, wow, and that was yeah. that was what six, seven years later, I think. Yeah, yeah, it held number one for a long time. And then those movies, I think he's restarting again. Yeah, good. Hopefully, this will the, work. This yeah, the, the first movie, of course, and but, you, know, you know, there's it, a couple it, that people always. I always have to carry them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna watch all this later and then call me and go, hey fucker. <laughs> yeah. Motherfucker you. This is exactly um, how I imagined the dynamic would be though between the two of you. So it works out pretty well. <laughs> well you all are pretty close in age too though, right? I mean yeah. so you're We're eighteen months apart. Okay. So that was probably, uh, I mean, I don't know. You, was it war growing up, or were you guys pretty much friends, or how did that work? Um, I guess like most siblings, there were time we we pretty much were friends for most of it. But we, you know, we'd have 
big knockdown drag outs. I think we're probably, we were closer then than we are now, probably. Hmm. You know, you kind of grow apart, go different ways. We don't live in right. the same town anymore. I gotcha. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the big, it was in the mid 80s. The horror mm. genre was huge. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I can I can kind of remember it a little bit, but um, well, the slasher craze was huge. Yeah. yeah, right. And then there were all kinds of uh, video labels doing like ultra low budget movies. So there was a lot of opportunities to make movies. Then that they're really, it doesn't seem like there is as many studios now doing that sort of thing. You either you know, it's a mainstream studio or you're independently trying to do it yourself, Kickstarter. Yeah. Or whatever. Well, you have a lot of streaming platforms. You have uh, Hulu and Netflix and uh, and uh, Shutter and uh, Tubi and uh, Amazon yeah. Prime and uh, you know a billion other ones that uh, you have open to you. Um, video was the one that was good for low budget films because you had a lot of it now it's kind of like the ones that are the ones that are filling that gap are the uh, streaming services for the low budget films um uh at least that's how it appears to me uh and things like friday the 13th were what would happen is paramount wouldn't produce them because then they would have to be made for more money they'd have to be union films so the film would be made by an ind independent company um, who was financed by uh, uh, maybe the studio, but the studio was not technically the produ production company or the producer of the film. And then they would buy the film from the independent and then they would release it. Yeah. And that happens less and less now. Unless you're Blumhouse, then, yeah. well, I mean, pretty much, you know, he's got an output deal, so he makes a film. It's still an independent Blumhouse film, but it knows it's going to get distributed already in advance. So with which, the... is, which is the perfect deal to have, but, you know, almost no one gets that. I was thinking, like, does anybody else have that kind of deal? Like, and how? Well, like... Um, there was a time when like um, uh, Lionsgate would have some kind of deal like that with uh, a major studio, but then they got big enough, they're kind of their own studio. And now smaller companies have output deals with Lionsgate. So you'll see a Lionsgate film, but it wasn't really made by Lionsgate. It was made somewhere else, and then Lionsgate just distributed it. Yeah. But with which board, though? Which, uh, by the way, you wrote Witchboard, didn't you? That was one yeah. that you actually wrote and direct. Yes. Now, the the thing that struck me about that movie, other than the fact that it's great, is no, is there any influence from like the Changeling? Because a lot of the I was I was curious about that. A lot of the the seance or the Ouija Ouija board scenes and things like that. I was the curious. Change, you mean the um, you mean the um, George C. Scott film? Yeah. No, no. If there was, I was completely not aware. You know, it might have been subconscious, but wow, no. I've never even heard anyone ask that before. So. <laughs> well, it's a lot of the scenes where they're talking to, I forget the kid's name, not the one that's the, the evil indie, but the one that they're trying to, David? you know, communicate. Yeah, David. It's a lot of that to me was reminiscent of the dialogue that was when they're, when they're doing the change where the woman's writing all the stuff and, you know, why did you wow. remain? And all that, no, that I got to tell you, I haven't seen that film in so long. I barely, all, you know what all I really remember is the banging tub. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. And the wheelchair rolling in to, at mm. the head of the stairs. And that's about it. Uh, that's pretty much all I remember. So if I did borrow from it, which I'm not saying I didn't, I could have subconsciously, but it was not a conscious choice. You know, it's funny, the film I hear the most uh, of people connected to is uh, The Exorcist. And I say only because The Exorcist shows her playing with the Ouija board and then it shows her possessed. And my film is what came between that. My film yeah. is what happens when you start all the way up to just where the possession starts. And then, you know, we stop it there. 
Um, if anything, the closest film, the film I mirrored script wise was The Omen. I tried to, I, I, I studied The Omen. I thought that was a really well crafted film. And I tried to make sure I hit plot points at around the same way in the same time. And one of the things I liked about The Omen was the few haunted house films I'd seen or supernatural films, the hero was always kind of just being subjected to the terror and he wasn't, you know, doing much. And I like the fact that they actually got on a plane and went to Rome and hunted down what was going on. So that's why I have my guys go up to uh, uh, Big Bear to find out if David is really David because I wanted him to be proactive. Yeah. I hadn't thought about the omen though, but I guess there's definitely some scenes in there that, yeah. And the kind of the pacing of the movie that, that mirrors that too. Yeah. Well, we're already getting requests for uh, Witchboard and Night of the Demons in 4K. I'm sure that'll happen at some point. <laughs> well, Night of the Demons was released on 4K already, but uh, Witchboard has not. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, Night of the Demons on a 4K steelbook from hmm. uh, from uh, Screen Factory. A couple oh, of years the... Uh, a couple oh, of years yeah, okay. Yeah, a couple of years I after they... They released the uh, both films for the. Well, first they time. remastered it in 4K. You're right. I don't think yeah. it's an actual. Yeah. So I'm sure that'll come. I mean, if they already remastered it in 4K, they'll probably do the full on 4K disc. Have you yeah. adopted that format at all yourself? No. Or how do you watch movies? Oh shit! <laughs> come on now. We need some luck with this internet shit today. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Somebody said something. If Dennis is checking this out, the mayor wanted to thank him for the autograph Night of the Demons vinyl. Night of the Demons vinyl is out of print and is quite valuable now, Uncle. But I didn't even know that it was out mm. or I would have got it. But yeah, I think it was a... Uh, I wish he was here, though, because that's, like, one of the best soundtracks. Like, especially that opening sequence. The yeah. title sequence and everything. That's a shame. I think we've lost both of them. Well, well it's just you on. and me. It's you and me. Let's talk about our films that we've done. Let's talk about fucking uh, well, back roads. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's talk about back roads. Let's talk about the big sale that's on shop.deadpit.com while we're here. <laughs> it's 35% off. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck's going on. We've never had this much trouble before. But this is a good, uh, a good learning Maybe there's experience. there's a storm up in uh, California or Southern California or wherever they're at. He says, let's perform a seance to summon the internet. <laughs> we need to do something. Oh, So have Lord. you watched... Have you watched anything, Uncle Bill, as of late? On, uh, I've watched all kinds of shit Blue lately. Ray Death or... Um, Anything you want to mention? Tons of stuff. So, uh, let's see. Stuff that I've gotten recently. I watched the Scream 4K, which I don't know if um, you've heard anything about that, but it looks fucking amazing. The Scream is, is cursed. cursed. You know what would reverse the curse, Uncle Bill? I'm, I've just got an idea. It just hit me. What? We need a review from steve let's do that? it let's do it this is this will uh, help the b plan is taking a look at the movie dead girl uh dead girl <clears throat> is about these two dumbass losers who uh for some reason end up in a basement of this abandoning uh, abandoned mental hospital and they find a uh uh, a dead girl uh, chained to a bed and uh, actually she's not dead she's a zombie and, and of course uh, one of the losers thinks he's gonna I guess he's got a love doll and that's basically where it goes from there <laughs> and the other guy's kind of having regrets but this uh, the other guy has one of the most fucked up haircuts I've ever seen and well, at least he's got hair, Steve. 
asshole. I just wanted him to die as soon as possible. But and so wow. they basically uh, the the one dude who of course is against it. He uh, doesn't touch the dead girl, but uh, for the most part, there's a lot of uh, zombie f- raping basically by this other dude and and a few other people. And the gore in here is kind of limited, but I mean, I guess it's so it's passable. I mean, I, I don't. It's not horrible. Um, I guess really the movie itself is trying to be artsy crafty or some bullshit, and it's really not. It's not that enjoyable. It's all dead, deadbeat, downbeat. I mean, what the fuck? Who cares? I mean, really? You can't. I mean, if you. Want- <laughs> oh God, that's awful. Okay. Welcome back. Hello. So somebody said, Kevin, that we should do a seance and summon the internet. We should do what? A seance to summon the internet. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. Because something, yeah, something's going on. Yeah, let me go get that. Something's possessed the lines or something. I don't know. Um, I think think Dennis just gave up on us. Yeah, Probably. I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure yeah. he did. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, somebody in here was wanting to thank him for the what was it? The vinyl soundtrack to Night of the Demons, which I didn't even realize was that that came out. Yeah, I was well, going to ask. You guys did well, we we kind of quit for a while. Okay, well, I advertise all this shit on my Facebook page. Yeah, they they the two albums set Night of the Demons soundtrack album CD and even. Cassette. Cassette. Now that yeah. yeah, that's the new thing, by the way. Yeah. The new old thing. Go go I don't know if they have anything left for sale, but you the Lunaris Records. L U N They don't. I, I checked yeah. today. I checked ah. today. Yeah. Yeah, they are completely sold out. I think they did like two or three different uh, variants on it too, right? They the did vinyl, like the five. Color. They had red, oh, really? they had yellow, they had black, they had clear. And then they had some that looked like spin dye, you know, where they put like paint on it and let it spread out as it was swirling. And that was called sour balls. <laughs> sour balls. That's, that's <laughs> great. That's a great time. Yeah. Um, I remember there was, they didn't release it worldwide. There was another com- uh, company overseas that was releasing it. It was the same album and through Linares, but there was another company releasing it. Maybe they still have copies. I can't remember the name though. I'll see if I can find out for you. Your best bet is just to, you know, always check on eBay and uh, Amazon. Uh, Tom Arnold is in here and he wanted to let you know that he loved the sailor. <laughs> oh, he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's Tom Arnold. If I'm being honest. <laughs> it could be. I mean, he, you know, yeah, he's not doing a whole lot these days. Well, you know what? If it is, and he loved, and he did like the seller, I appreciate that very much. Hopefully, you're talking about my director's cut uh, is the one you liked. But um, thank you. Um, I've got I it right actually, here. You can buy buy it now yeah. on vinegarsyndrome dot com. Yes, you can, um, and it comes with both versions: my director's cut and the producer's cut, which you know. They could have recorded something else over that that would have been more worthwhile, but you know that's just my opinion. Um, but Tom, thank you. Isn't it crazy though? Like, there's all these they call them boutique labels that's out now. Yeah, that yeah. are. I think Vinegar Syndrome says it's like um, preserv- film preservation is what they do because yeah, a lot of these movies have never been out on even DVD before. I don't. Th- the Sailor wasn't on DVD before, was it? At no, least here in the no. U.S. It wasn't even out. It never even made it to Laserdisc. It was a VHS release, and that was it. Um, which, considering it was the producer's cut, I was okay with. <laughs> Not a lot of people seeing it. Um, uh, yeah, no, I'm telling you, um, the companies that the bigger companies that own the rights to these films and they put them out, they just throw them on a disc and send them out there for profit. And don't give them the kind of treatment. I wish all of my films, even the ones that have been out on DVD, would either get released by Vinegar Syndrome or um, uh, Scream Factory because they Mm -hmm. did such an amazing job, you know. 
I mean, uh, what was it, a 45-minute documentary on the sailor? I mean, I don't know if you're going to find too many more people that would be doing that. I mean, they would be yeah. the only ones. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. the sailor is like a mainstream movie compared to some of the stuff they release. Seriously. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's uh, because they, yeah. will, they will do 4K <laughs> releases for yeah. Scanner Cop. Well, yeah, and this actually had, you know, I mean, it actually had a budget and it actually had a uh, name actor in Patrick Kilpatrick, um, mm -hmm. who I think was in Scanner Cop, too. So I think they got him to come in and do commentary for both films. So. It's actually got uh, Lou Perryman in it, which is like one of the few films besides Texas Chainsaw, too, I've ever seen Lou Perryman in. Yeah, uh, yeah. But he went by Lou Perry in our film. Oh, nah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, he was a character. Yeah, we I got to, interviewed I got him to, back in the day. I uh, I got to do two scenes with him, and he was uh, he was uh, he was great. He knew his lines. He hit his marks. He was really easy to work with. I got to work with a couple of people on that that I was really excited to work with. Lou was one. Patrick absolutely was another. And then the guy who played the sheriff, because he had been a regular on High Chaparral, a kid I a show I watched when I was a kid. So I was very excited to work with him too. One thing that I want, maybe you don't know. I mean, that typically, like with these Scream Factory releases, which this is a good release for sure. Yeah, yeah. But they didn't do the collector's edition treatment with this one, like they and did you know with what? They, Demons. they say now they should have because since since I was the one giving them everything for both, you know, I was lining up the cast, I was finding uh -huh. old uh, clips of uh, uh, deleted scenes, and I was, you know, um, they ended up. Get, they said all they would have had to do was make a new cover for it, and it would have been a collector's edition because everything we did for Night of the Demons, we did for Witchboard. We have a ton. We have a big documentary for Witchboard. We have a ton of behind the scenes footage. It's so funny because back then nobody did these. You know, the studios did press release kits for advert so that like ET or something would show behind the scenes stuff and talk about the movie to hype it, but things that were going straight to VHS, no one was shooting behind the scenes stuff, but because me and the producer, Jeff Giafray, were both right out of film school, we got some other film students to come and just shoot everything, just shoot behind the scenes stuff on video just to have it. So Witchboard ended up having a ton of behind the scenes stuff that you don't usually see for a film, especially not a low budget horror film from the eighties. We have like interviews with the cast. You know, we'd pull them aside on set and interview them and and shots of us, you know, them watching us while we film sequences. So a lot of great stuff. If you're a fan of Witchboard, there's a lot of extra stuff on the disc. It's not just a nicer version of the film, which, by the way, it is. Uh, it's amazing. When I saw that Night of the Demons on Blu-ray, I'd forgotten. Oh yeah, this is what these things look like in a theater. That's right, because I got used to the yeah. VHS versions of them. Right. Um, but it's not just that; it's a ton of behind-the-scenes stuff that the that the general public never sees. Promotional material that got sent directly to the um, uh, the mom and pop video stores to in get make them inclined to buy a copy of the film to you know put on their shelves. So and then a lot of behind the scenes and they they did a big interview where they got they got everyone from the cast and crew of both films to come in and do interviews. So they did a really nice job. Oh yeah, I mean it's stacked. I was just kind of curious because there's so many features on it and it's to me, I mean looking at it like hardcore horror fans would say Night of the Demons is probably the more well-known movie. But I think I hear more outside the genre people reference Witchboard from time to time. My wife knew what it was, and she's not a horror yeah. fan at all. Well, Witchboard played, you know, was in a, a thousand theaters uh, and uh, premiered on HBO as the number one uh, film of the week. And when it premiered, when it was in theaters, it went up to the number five nationally, the fifth highest grossing film of the week, you know. So, uh, yeah, I can see why a lot of people would, people who aren't necessarily big horror fans, definitely would have heard of Witchboard over Night of the Demons. But the hardcore horror fans, yes, Night of the Demons is there. Yeah, I mean, it's still, it's referenced probably a little bit more amongst hardcore yeah. horror fans. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And the the Ouija board movies though was it was there anything really before? I don't I can't recall off the top of my head. There may have been, but like this, it seemed like this one kind of got. You know, my wife still this day. You're not bringing the Ouija board home. It's not <laughs> happening. We're not doing it. You know, and we even come up as another song we come up with back in the day. We were talking about "Eat a Bowl of Fuck." I'm here to party is a Hellord tune from back in. <laughs> 2002, Jeez. 2003. We had another I, one that said, uh, I can't don't, believe that never went platinum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It should have. It just don't go, man. don't go messing with a Ouija board because yeah. my, my, well, she was my girlfriend at the time, but yeah, no, she's like, no, you're not bringing, you're not bringing one home. So it still has oh, a lasting shit, effect like, for a lot of people. Uh oh, more technical difficulties. Oh, God, what's going on? Oh, no. <laughs> well, hell. I think that Pinocchio is were, some Ouija a, board shit going on. There's a death curse on this fucking fuck <laughs> On this string. It has a curse. Anyway, let's take a moment for me to say, Ouija, Ouija, wah, 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 Ouija. Don't go messing with the Ouija board. You'll hear voices from the <laughs> dark lord. We should have had that song ready. Oh, we yeah. should have. Um, Pinocchio's Revenge. <laughs> oh, we got to talk about that if he comes back on. Uh, yeah. We still haven't even talked about Night of the Demons. Well, well you know. We can. We've talked to him about Night of the Demons quite a bit before, but we're going to dedicate part of this to Pinocchio's Revenge. Well, yeah, we've I got mean, a we got a politic. We want to do the the fan commentary for the for the 4K release from Vinegar Syndrome. I really want to uh, to talk to him too, or talk to somebody about uh, what was it, Honey? Can I keep her? <laughs> Mommy, can I keep her? Something like that, which looks like. Harry and the Hendersons or something like that. Oh, the Bigfoot movie? Is it the Bigfoot movie? I don't think that's the Bigfoot movie. I think it's like a monkey movie, but maybe not like Bigfoot. Oh. Now, he did a Bigfoot movie, too, that looked just like Harry and the Hendersons. Yeah. Which I I think that he'd said that that, that was one of those deals where he, he was brought on late, like yeah. way through the shoot. I can't remember what the fuck that movie's name is, but it's not Mom Can I Keep Her. That's what the... I don't think that that's what it's called. Hold on. I think it's just called Bigfoot, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think you're right. I can't even find it on here now. Yeah, Bigfoot. 2009. Yeah, the, the Bigfoot did look very close to Harry, for sure. <clears throat> Ouija. Witch, Witch Board 2, of course. And it was weird, too, because Witch Trap, all over the VHS on Witch Trap, I remember this still this day, this is not a sequel to Witch Board. Yep. Okay. All right. <laughs> all right, I'm back. Welcome back. We were just talking about the fact that Witch Trap is definitely not a sequel to Witch Board. Yeah, that I just was want to all make sure the tape. You didn't everybody want to, knew yeah, that. You want people to think that. No way. Well, yeah, when we shot it, it was actually called The Presence, and then the distributor bought it, and because we used the same guy to play the villain, uh, J.P. Lubson, he put it front and center on the cover and called the title and changed the title to Witch Trap, and then the guys who produced Witchboard jumped all over him. They called me all mad. And I said, guys, I'm the director. I never have anything to do with the title. Come on. I said, I've shot the pre I shot a film called The Presence, you know. The same way I shot a film called Halloween Party. <laughs> it became Night of the Demon. So. You couldn't use Halloween Party. Like, you would think, how, why, how could somebody trademark Halloween Party? He couldn't. But he was powerful, and we were a new company. And, yeah. Um, he basically told them he would make sure they wouldn't get ENO insurance for their next film. So basically, he kind of threatened to pull his weight and blackball them. 
Jeez. Mm. So it all worked out. I think so. I might have overlit here, so I'm going to turn one light off. Okay. Look at this. Probably saw Steve's review and left. <laughs> <laughs> Poor old Steve. <clears throat> but um, what we were going to bring up, though, another vinegar syndrome release. I actually just got this not too long ago. I haven't uh -huh. checked out the new, yeah. the new edition. And they do such a bang up job with all these releases. Are you? Oh, yeah, is yeah. there any other, any other uh, movies you're looking at? Is there anything else that you can actually? I know that with the sailor, you had that print, right? That was your, right. that was in your library. That was the only copy of my cut. So I also had the unrated print of um, uh, Witch Trap. But what they were able to do there was just, it was just some scenes had been trimmed to get the R rating. So I gave them my print. They mastered, they remastered a, a better quality copy that had been made for broadcast and then just dropped in the edited footage um, from my print. But with the seller, because the producers recut the film so drastically, it's so different, um, mm -hmm. they had to actually do a master from my, my uh, answer print. So my cut of the film is the actual answer print. And they did a bang up job because to get a print to get it to look that good when it's off a of print rather than a inner pause or a, at least a negative, um, they did a really nice job. I thought. And so I was what? Glad to, uh, I, was just, I was I was glad to finally have it on a decent format. What happened with the sailor? Like with the producer's cut and all that? Like how did that get to that point? Oh. Um, you know what? We cover it in the documentary in great length, but ba uh, on the on the DVD of uh, the Blu-ray there. But basically, um, they had another director. The film was like he was a first-time director. He was in over his head. In the first five days, they were like three days behind, and they called me up on a Friday and asked if I'd read the script. I did. They said, could you come in tomorrow on the weekend, Saturday? And I went in and met with them. And right there, they hired me, put me on the plane to Tucson on Sunday. And I was on the set first thing Monday directing, having just met the cast, the three main actors briefly that night before when I first flew in. And, um, and rewriting the script while I was shooting it. Jesus. So not a lot of time there to uh, like get acclimated to anything going on around you. Well, I actually, I actually had asked them if um, uh, I said, could you like close down? Give me two days to rewrite the script or to do script because there were problems with the script. And I said, that's what I need to do first and let me meet the crew and and they said we can't afford to shut down so i said okay but so long as you understand i'm going to be directing like basically from the seat of my pants because at that point i hadn't seen daily so i i didn't even know for sure what had already been shot and what hadn't one of the reasons i took the film was for a couple of scenes i wanted to direct and it turned out those had already been done so i didn't get to do that. oh geez um but uh I, what happen, What happens a lot of times, and I saw this in film school, somebody's film would be a fucking disaster. It would just be a mess. And then they'd fix it to a degree. You'd re-edit, maybe shoot a couple of new scenes and put them in there. And now the film wasn't great still, but compared to what it had been, it's Citizen Kane. <laughs> but... And that's what happened when we did the cast and crew screening of my my uh, cut. Everybody went nuts. They're like, oh, my God, because they knew what a disaster the project had been when I came in and took over. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, Patrick Kilpatrick came up to me and said, wow, man, you just made chicken salad out of chicken shit. 
So, um, but the thing is, what they don't realize is to someone who hasn't seen the original and had that to compare it with, you know, it's like if this is a five, but the original cut was a one, then suddenly my my version looks like an eight in comparison. Oh, yeah. But someone who hasn't seen the first version, they see a five, you know, and I, told <coughs> them, I said, we now have a perfect, perfectly serviceable horror film, but it's not. And they were at the cast and crew screening. The producers were just going nuts. You know, oh, you're great. But boo, 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 boo. You know how wonderful the film was. And I was the one that kept saying, you know, as they were giving me all these accolades, I was the one saying, um, it's okay. It, it works now, but it's, it's not going to be, it's not destined for like, you know, class being a classic or anything, but so they, they went out to distributors with this idea that they had this classic gone with the wind of horror films. <laughs> And they got a couple of decent offers, but they thought they were too low. So they figured, oh, must be something wrong with Kevin's cut. So they went back in. They got some guy who I'd never heard of who shot new scenes, recut it. Um, just, oh, my God. It's such, it's an, a mess. He added all this narration that doesn't tell you anything. So it actually makes the film more confusing. You know, it's like if you're adding narration to try to clarify stuff, that's one thing. But his narration actually ended up making the film a confused mess, whereas it was a pretty straightforward, easy to follow story before the narration was added. Um, again, at one point, they wrote me a two page letter. Dennis scored the film at first. And they wrote me uh, the one producer who was kind of the guy that was shepherding this particular film for their company, uh, wrote me a two page letter just going nuts about how great the music was, how Dennis's score captured these different sequences so beautifully. And then when they decided, oh, we're not getting the kind of offers we should, they come back and call me and they say, Dennis, music sucks. We have to get a new composer. And, then, <laughs> and it sounds and, like they were just scrambling to like, just do what, it, like anything, like just pick anything out of the movie. Like it's the direction, it's the score. It's, it's the, it's really hard for people to accept that what they've got is not that good. And, you know, but it's, it's as good as it's going to get right there. And uh, they could have made some money off of it, you know, if they hadn't gone back and spent more money trying to fix something that was not going to be fixed, you know? Yeah. I saw um, the guys at Blue Rider who did Witchboard and Night of the Demons. Between those two films, they did a film called Tips, which I had said, don't do this script. It's not a good script. The story idea itself is bad. It was a romantic comedy about a guy who wants to be a, a painter, but he works in a restaurant. I said, yeah, there's something visually. <laughs> that just and sounds it, awful. Oh, <laughs> no, it's like, there's nothing oh. visual. There's nothing, you remember this is a movie, not a play, right? There's yeah. nothing visual about this idea. And it's supposed to be a comedy. And it was just a disaster. And they kept throwing money, good money after bad. And they, they hired a new director. Like the other director was a first time director and she made some mistakes, but it wasn't her. It, the script was a bad script to begin with. And I had told them that, you know, um, and they did, they spent a ton of money on it, trying to fix it. And I had said, just release it as it is. You didn't, you know, it's a low budget film, maybe package it with one, with Witchboard or Night of the Demons or something, and someone will take it to get the other one. Um, but otherwise, but no, they got a new director, they got a, they reshot like 70% of the movie. So basically they shot the movie twice, you know, and didn't improve it any the second time either. Um, and just, you know, and when they called me about Night of the Demons, it was because they were worried that if Night of the Demons didn't, wasn't a hit, this film would have maybe, you know, been their um, Waterloo. 
Well, <laughs> this is an interesting thing about Night of the Demons, though, and this could be one of those things that's completely wrong. So this is a, this is like an IMDb fact, but I'm curious about okay. it. So I'll ask you: Did it not come out like nationwide? It only came out in uh, like sporadic, yeah. bigger cities and things like it, that. It was more like um, regional releases. They opened it in Detroit and a few other cities back there, and they promoted it really well. Um, and it just killed. It wiped out. It even beat out whatever the newest, the newest. Um, I can't remember if it was the newest Nightmare on Elm Street film or the newest um, Halloween, but in Detroit, it had a bigger opening weekend than a major sequel did. And um, and from there it moved on. I know when I saw it, I saw it later. And when it was playing in L.A., I went to a theater. It was on a double bill with um, whatever Halloween film was out at that time. So probably Halloween four, maybe. I That's what I was remember. thinking. Yeah, eighty eight. Yeah, yeah. So so we're watching it, and there's two frat boys down there making fun of the film. And there's this a uh, uh, couple of uh, black gals in front of me who are not talking to the screen or anything. They're just, and I'm thinking here, uh, and, and my film's come, and Night of the Demon's going to come up after that. And I'm thinking, oh my God, if Halloween is getting, these gals <laughs> are not real. These gals are not reacting at all. And the two uh, frat rats are making fun of it. We're fucked. And then, um, our film comes up and the frat rats are joking around for like 10 minutes and then they stop and then they're dead silent the rest of the time. And in one of the scenes, maybe when Angela's floating down or something, I don't know, I see one of the girls in front of me and she's pulled up her knees and pulled her coat up over her <laughs> knees and then she's holding it up and she's watching the film like this. And I'm like, holy cow, that's great, you know? The two most diverse sides of the oh, yeah. audience you could get, and they were both completely responding to it. So it's, I mean, it's pretty much a perfect film in and of the fact that it balances comedy and horror really, really well. I think, and like the scary I don't scenes, like real life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the the scenes that are supposed to be funny are really funny, and the scenes that are supposed to be scary are actually scary, which is really, really hard to do, but. You most know. of the crew, most of the crew, even uh, even Joe, the writer, producer's girlfriend, didn't think I could. Do they said, "Well, obviously, it's going to be a campy film," and I said, "Why?" And they said, "Well, you know." And I said, "No, no, 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 no." I said, "No, the dialogue's hysterical. That's the main reason I took the script was, I thought the dialogue was really funny." And I, I'm a firm believer that even if the character is an asshole, if they're funny, the audience will respond to them. Well, this has got the best asshole character ever, <laughs> like yeah, Al yeah. Evans. Yeah. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So it's like, um, uh, I just thought I can make these characters people that the audience will actually give a shit about. And I thought there's enough stuff in here I can make scary. I can make scary and it's simple stuff like in the script they kick open the door because you know uh, Sal and uh, uh, um, Roger happen upon Kathy uh, or um, Judy when she's locked in the room that she was in with Jay yeah and so he tells her to stand back from the door and he kicks it and so in the script opens the door she comes out and, but Joe had written it that you don't go into the room. You hear her through the door. And Roger says, what if it's not her? So I thought, okay, so he's got this great tense moment where the audience will go, oh, yeah, what if it's not her? What if it's a demon fucking with him? So I said, let's extend that. He kicks open the door, and she's not just standing there. And he's kind of standing there, starting to poke his head and debating whether to go in. And then she leaps out and hugs him like, oh, thank God. But it's like, boom, you know? So just things like that. I thought, this I could make this scary. Yeah, there's a lot of scenes that I'm sure like were added upon like that too that, that made it, I think the levitation scene, that's like one of the, sc 
in that I mean like the scene where Angela's like going down yeah. the hallways. Yeah, that's freaky <laughs> that's, as hell. That's one of the best. Like, yeah, and they're kind of looking around the the corners, yeah. and you just see her kind of like float by. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, in and of its in and of itself, it doesn't take a lot. But I'd I'd be remiss, like, because a bunch of people are asking about this too, uh, on the chat. Like, whose idea was it for the Baja song to be while like Angela is dancing? Okay, well, Joe was very. I was I was old school hair hard, hardcore, not hardcore, but old dinosaur rock. <laughs> Some of my friends <laughs> called it back then. You know, I was a big fan of just rock and roll and, uh, and some hard rock, but not like necessarily speed metal, hair metal kind of stuff. Air bands and uh, and the classics, you know, Led Zeppelin, the Beatles, uh, that ilk. So Joe was definitely a punker. He was punk rock. So that's why they've got all these bands. And we wanted to try to get more of that music, but we just didn't have the budget. So basically, we made a deal with Dennis to score the film, and he had songs over the years that they had recorded from his different bands. And we just cut that, you know, said, I'll pick the songs that I think work, and they'll just be incorporated in the price of the score because they're already recorded. He didn't have to do anything. So, which would have been a great question for him if he were here. <laughs> I know, like, I would love yeah. to ask him about the title sequence and the score yeah. for that and everything, too. But yeah, yeah. Here we are. Yeah, that was brilliant, I thought. I I had not thought we were going to be able to do a song that would go well with the credits, and then he played that, and it was like, oh, yeah, this is this is badass. This is, gonna, yeah. this, this is going to set the tone for the whole movie exactly the way we want it. But, um, but so, so um, Joe had a Bauhaus song picked that she would dance to, and she came in and said, you know what? I think this one's better. So she picked um, the uh, Stigmarter Martyr um, and danced to it. And we played, that's what she danced to on set. And then me and the editor cut it together. And we said, this works so well. Let's see if we can afford to get this one song. Now, luckily, Bauhaus was, you know, known in the punk community, but not big and um we were able to get it we were able to get it for a price we could afford and uh and so we were able to use that one bauhaus song and their popularity went up with the film i can imagine that's that whole scene is like a i don't know it's kind of iconic i can imagine that it's pretty yeah. iconic in that circle too yeah 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 exactly that's what i'm thinking you know it's like that was a perfect mixture of horror and music together you know if you're a horror fan you became a Bauhaus fan after yep. that and if you were a Bauhaus fan you maybe became a horror fan after that you know or at least a Night of the Demons fan hopefully there, there's just something about that well to me there's something about like the first three movies that you did I'm not sure like the atmosphere the tone like something about them is just is great uh starting with Witchboard then going you know to Night of the Demons and 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 but especially with Night of the Demons, I don't know what it is exactly. I mean, maybe you know more than I do. Like the combination of well, there are a few things. Um, I had a lot more creative control back then. When I was doing Witchboard, I was <laughs> I was fresh out of film school. I'd never made a feature, but compared to everyone else on the set, the producers anyway, compared to most of the above the line except for the crew, I knew more about making movies than Walter, the guy who raised the money, did, or or Jeff. Uh, who was producing knew how to produce, but I was the writer director and I, you know, and Jeff, I went to film school. So he knew from film school that I knew what I was doing as far as creatively. So they kind of gave me a wide berth. And then after they had problems with their second film that I had told them, and basically everything I said would go wrong did. So when Walter called me, he said, well, everything you said would go wrong did. So we want you to come back and do Night of the Demon. And at that point, I had a real free hand because I remember at once he uh, he threw Joe. Joe came and said, Walter's been looking at the dailies and he's concerned that you're not doing any coverage. You're just doing these long pans and dollies. And I said, um, 
why doesn't he get the director of tips to come in and take over? <laughs> And uh, and Joe was like, no, no, I'll talk to Walter. Uh, you know, we'll, 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 I'll tell him to back off. And that was it. That was the last I heard. And then Witch Trap, I formed my own company, and me and my editor from Witchboard Night of the Demons co-produced it. So I had complete creative control. We had issues with one of the crew people. Basically, the sound got completely dead, ruined. So we ended up having to ADR the entire movie. So the whole film is dubbed. And that's we another. Had, we had four days to do it, so that's all we could afford if the st in the sound studio it was four days. So was that uh, Dennis too? I know he did a lot of ADR work. Yeah, it was. It was a studio he was half owner in. Yeah, and um, and he had done the music and all of that, and then um, yes. He and his partner gave us, a, like over the weekend when they didn't have a paying customer book, they let us come in and do two days free, and then we paid for another two days. And uh, yeah, that's that was it, you know. Well, the other thing, too, that there's a bunch of people that are going to mention on here as well about Night of the Demons is, <laughs> is Linnea Quigley. Like, that's always going to be like something that's associated with that movie, like her scenes in the movie <laughs> as well. Although... Yeah. Like, for my own personal kind of, like, whatever, I think Cal Havens pretty much was the biggest part of that. In terms of the actors, yeah, yeah. like, he's he's just the one that, like, steals the show, in my opinion. Like, yeah, I yeah, don't know. He's, he's, he's definitely one of the fan favorites, for sure. Yeah, and I was curious, like, okay, how did the, that come about with him and, and, like, casting him and Linnea? And... We just, you know, had casting, and people came in and read for us, and we picked the best ones we could out of, you know, what who came in um tedra gabriel who had cast the film um it was so funny because a lot of um a lot of the agents for the actors hated the script they thought huh. it was foul mouth and you know stupid and uh, and we'd had like all the big companies even though i was an unknown director with witchboard because it was a more character driven script we had a, a actors coming in from icm caa william morris all the big agencies they weren't sending us their name people but they were sending us people who very likely would become name people because they were with william morris or icm or caa or gersh um uh Night of the Demons, Tedra said, would call them and say, oh, we didn't get a sub your submission of actors. And they said, oh, we're not submitting. <laughs> <laughs> we're not submitting. And, and on top of that, it was pilot season. So even unknown kids, we'd say, oh, we really like her. We want her. And they'd say, yeah, but she's up for a pilot. I said, yeah, but we're offering her the job. She might not get the pilot. I said, we'll take our chances. <laughs> oh, God, that's yeah, pretty was, harsh. Oh, yeah. It was it was brutal. It was brutal. <laughs> I always Whoa. say that I always say that you know because Witchboard hadn't come out yet, so I was still a nobody to the the agencies and the audience and everyone. And then uh, I always say that um, uh, Brian Trenchard Smith had it so much easier with Night of the Demons too, because by the time he was casting that, one had now become a big hit and a cult favorite. So people were all lined up to come read for part two, you know. That's so true. And I don't know. I mean, do you get asked about kind of your opinion about Night of the Demons 2 or 3? Occasionally they ask about 2. I actually think 2 is, I know some people don't like it. I think it's a really, really good sequel. I always think I, that too. Like, I don't, I've I always, think yeah. I think, I think his is, I don't think his is as scary as mine. But if you know Brian, his sensibilities lean more to the comedy. So he made, I think his film is more comedic than mine, but it's thoroughly entertaining. I mean, it's like I saw it at the cast and crew screening having not even read the script. And I was like, holy cow, this is great. You know, um, part three, I wrote, but then they sent it up to a director in Canada and producers in Canada. And that was it. I had no control over it. And I just... And the funny thing is, Amelia liked that. She goes, oh, my God, I love this script because she got to do more as not in the demon makeup. You know, she got to actually develop her character. And I tried to do that. That's something that had not been done too well. The first one, they were all archetypes. Yeah. Uh, the second one, I think, had more character. 
Uh, I think Joe was a better writer by then. You know, Night of the Demons One was his first script, so I think, I think, uh, I always, <laughs> I always get so mad at uh, Brian. I say, man, you got a bigger budget. You got the, <laughs> you got the benefit of it coming on the heels of a hit. And Joe was a better writer, man. I mean, across the board, <laughs> you, uh, the casting was easier for him. It, they weren't casting in pilot season, and the, and it was a sequel to a popular film. Uh, part three, I wrote, um, Amelia liked the script, uh, Jeff and Walter liked the script a lot, you know, thought it was, uh, because I had developed the characters of the kids as well as Angela got a lot more development. And then uh, the director up there had not seen the first two films, didn't get the humor mixed with the horror. They picked a house that looked like, you know, a family had just moved out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it was not like a haunted house. And the thing is, because I wrote it thinking they were going to shoot it down here in the original house, I wrote it for the original house. Then when they went up to Canada, I thought, well, they'll find a house that looks like it. And they, you know, and then I saw the dailies and I was like, damn, if you guys, if I'd known the house looked that drastically different, I would have written something about how the first one got torn down and a family built a new house thinking that would take care of all the problems and spent a weekend there and got killed. And so the house was closed up and left alone again. You know, it would have been so easy yeah. to address that in the title sequence. Um, and I have stuff in the script that doesn't make sense. Like they can't get over the, you know, they can't get over the wall. The wall is this tall in the new house. It's like, <laughs> That's right. I forgot about that. But you're, it's yeah. Like, yeah, it's like, um, hello. <laughs> I wrote it. It was going to be a big brick wall like it was in the first two films. Um, so that was a, you know, the minute they knew they weren't shooting it there, they should have, they should have spent the money to send me up there so I could look at the house and rewrite the script to fit the house. Cause that's what Joe and I did with the first script. He wrote the script. Then once we found the house, we liked, we kind of went through and picked, well, this room will be this scene. This room will be this scene. And we came up with the climbing over the wall because it had that chunk of brick wall there with barbed wire on the top and we stood there and went oh what if they had to climb up the barbed wire yeah cool so he went back and wrote it that way you know and that's what they should have done with me for part three that and get a different director <laughs> you know, one, <laughs> wow. one, well, yeah. one, who would one actually, that actually one who, knew yeah one who would actually respond to the material or gave a damn about it you know i'm not saying he's a bad director but he obviously had no clue what he was doing on that film or he had no, he hadn't seen the first two. So he didn't know about the, how it was comedy mixed with a uh, horror and that you had to balance it just right. You know? Well, that's the thing. That's a really hard thing to do, especially if you just don't, if you're not invested. In yeah. 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 But the, so, so I'm very disappointed of all my films. That's the one I would love to see remade with a decent house and uh, you know, and a director who, gave a shit about the the series well somebody asked too about like what your feelings about the remake are and i know that um that came out like what was it 2000 yeah nine i don't know mm -hmm. somewhere around in there yeah yeah uh how did you respond to that one i'm the i'm the one that put it all together yeah i i got the property from the guys at uh, blue rider pictures and because they knew me and trusted me they uh, gave me a free option, and I took that over to um, uh, Seven Arts, where we had already been negotiating about doing a Witchboard remake with them. And um, and then he said, I have a director, a young guy who just did a film for me that I really like. So I saw the film, and I said, yeah, I met him, uh, uh, um, Adam Garage, mm -hmm. and he was a big fan of the originals, as was his wife, Jace, who co-wrote their script. Um, so I put it all together. I was one of only a handful of producers. They had other producers. And I actually had another film, Bigfoot, which I directed at the exact same time as Night of the Demons was being made. So that three-week period that Night of the Demons remake and Bigfoot were both being made. They weren't supposed to be, but because there were weather issues in New Orleans, uh, Night of the Demons ended up getting pushed back and fell right into the film I was directing. But there were like four other producers. So it's not like you can't have one producer leave and still get the film made. It's not like with the director, the director leaves, you've got to find a new director. Yeah. Um, but I thought that I liked their script when I read it. Um, 
I made notes on the script. Then I went off and did Bigfoot. And then um, when they were editing, I made notes on their cut. But I kind of didn't push too far because I, you know, someone asked me about that. And I said, listen, I already made my Night of the Demons. This, yep. this can't be me remaking it. You know, it's got to be Adam and Chase's Night of the Demons. And I know fans have problems with it here and there. Um, some fans like it better than the original. Um, I have some problems with it too, but I have some problems with my own Night of the Demons. Um, Adam got flack for certain things that I thought were, okay, rightfully so. I kind of warned him, if you do this, you're going to get flack. But he got flack for stuff that, like, they complained, oh, it took so long for the demons to come make an appearance. It's like his demons make an appearance like 10 minutes sooner than mine. <laughs> you know? That's what I was thinking. I mean, like, yeah. Yeah, in the, yeah. 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 Mine, you're halfway through the film before the demons appear in mine. They appear a lot sooner in his film. Um, but, but you know, he said once, he goes, the most important lesson he learned directing that was you can't fight nostalgia. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> it's it so, so true. true. And so much of the stuff people complained about we had the same issue on the first, on the original. So it's like, wait a minute, you're complaining about this, even though it's basically exactly what we did on the original too. So um, I think of all the sequels, all the remakes that got made in that time frame. There's a lot. I think it's one of the best. Yeah, I think it's definitely like a, a lot better than a lot of the mainstream sequels that got or remakes that got made at that time. Yeah, better than the Friday the 13th. Nightmare yep, Elm Nightmare on Elm Street, The Fog. Halloween. I could name like 20 of them. That yeah. were, like... yeah, were nowhere near as good as the yeah. Night of the Demons remake. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. And uh, and believe me, I'm not biased. If, if I thought it was shit, I would say shit, you know. Um, I actually, I would rate the films of the four, one, two, the remake and three. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's that's fair. I think. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah. mentioned though, like at the beginning too, that you were at one point in time pushing to get like a, a sequel to that made. Had you have done that, what would have been the, what would have been the gist? Like, what would have been the plot? Um, oh man, it's uh. Or can they, you say they that have a, they have a new rave party in a graveyard, and um. And Angela's spirit manages to cross and come back. And, and we were going to have um, Tiffany play Angela. Um, Tiffany Shepes? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that would have been amazing. Oh, like, it would have been great. Yeah. And, and the script was written by her husband, Sean Trotta. It was hysterical. It was really funny. Had some great plot twists. And, and w at one point, Angela, because they're in a graveyard when she's going after the kids she basically sticks her hand into the ground and a bunch of corpses pop up and yeah do her, do her bidding so <laughs> it's like it's it was just really cool and it was um um like i said a really funny script and some great characters because sean's more like me and that he writes for characters in his, you see the films he made with Tiffany before they became a couple, and they were much more like Witchboard in that they were character-driven horror films versus blood and gore horror films. But this one was blood, gore, you know, everything that you want in a Night of the Demons film, plus really funny dialogue and funny characters. And uh, Jason and Adam were going to um, executive produce. I was going to produce. We got... Um, oh, Jeez, I'm having a mental. I'm 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 sundowning here. <laughs> I should do these interviews in the morning. Um, but the guy who directed uh, Hellraiser three. And oh God, he, Anthony Hickox. Yes, he was going to yeah. be the director, and Harry Manfredini was going to do the music, and Gabe Bartalos was going to do the effects. Wow, that's that's a hell of a lineup, really. Oh yeah, we had like everybody in place, and Monica was going to come back, Monica Kina. And um, uh, and uh, like I said, Tiffany was going to be Angela. I mean, she's we we always really like loved mm -hmm. her on Dead Pit. Oh, she's and she's got a, she's a really good actress. Um, definitely looks good naked, but she's a, <laughs> but I mean, but she's you know, but she's not just that. She's a she's actually a strong actress. She is, and she's a dynamo. 
She's with, got tons uh, of charisma too. Like she so could pull that off. You put her in a film and then just set her free, let her go to all these conventions. She's better than a PR firm. She is. She will, <laughs> she will hawk the shit out of your movie, you know? I think that's so, the, the trauma background. I think that she got yeah. that from Lloyd and like doing all that for trauma and yeah, just hawking maybe. all that. Yeah. Maybe. But um, yeah, and I just adore her as a person too. You know, she's uh, she's good people. Yeah, she's great. So I there's there's a couple of people too that I hope that that at some point in time gets made the the night of the you demons. know what I was gonna say as a matter of fact the ter first time I actually met I knew who she was but the first time she and I met in person was at the convention where I came to see you guys oh god that would have been uh, what was that Friday night in Louisville I think yeah I think it was Louisville Friday yeah night? yeah I think it was yeah yeah she was there I remember that yeah yeah and uh, I, she was there and she was sitting next to us and and. She, she started giving me shit right away. <laughs> yeah, and that's how you know, like, yeah, she, yeah, she's great. She gives everybody shit like a ton. Oh, yeah, like, well, uh, you know, I'm a sarcastic a hole, so it, <laughs> you know, I have no room to talk. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's the first time we met was because I came there to see you guys. It was a great time too. That yeah, particular yeah. commission. So there's a bunch of other people on here too, but that we're asking about. Um, Pinocchio's Revenge. When you say and, when you say a bunch, do you like mean like ten? <laughs> I mean like yeah, yeah, around that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm scrolling through the comments, but there's a lot of people that want to hear about Pinocchio's Revenge. That's a fan <laughs> favorite. I'll say that for certain. So I have about a ten people want to know. <laughs> <laughs> <It's a trip. laughs> okay, so, what do you want to know about it? Well, I would imagine just like kind of how that that project started too and what your memories are on the set of that um the lead actor was really wooden uh <laughs> <laughs> <That's great. laughs> yeah yeah he just, you know, he's just oh man he just couldn't <laughs> um actually um trimark made it and they had made the leprechaun films and they talked to me like for, for Leprechaun 2, Leprechaun 3, um, both they tried to get me to come in and uh, talk to them about directing them. I didn't like the first Leprechaun and I didn't want to do one. You know who did them though? Huh? You know who did do them though? No. De my brother, Dennis my brother, did a couple of them. Dennis <laughs> scored two of them yeah. for Ryan Trenchard Smith, that asshole. <laughs> I think you did so, three and five. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, no, three and four. Brian did three, three and four. four. Oh, right. And Dennis did the score for him. And That's the, guys, and they, the producers for hire who produced those two were the guys from Blue Rider who had produced Witchboard Night of the Demons. Uh, oh, by then, they were no longer raising money through private investors. They were producers for hire, and they would get hired. And uh, they got hired to do two Leprechaun films. At that time, they were also hired. Um, they had found a guy who'd written a Pinocchio script, a horror script, and they took it to um, uh, Trimark. And Trimark said, yeah, we love the idea. Let's do a bad Pinocchio movie. Uh, but then the guy thought it should be like a, you know, I think they were going to pay, they were going to budget at one five. And he thought, and I don't know this, this is all secondhand I'm getting from the producer. But basically, he thought the film should be like a $3 million film. And there was no way Trimark was going to spend $3 million on a killer Pinocchio film. And um, so he, he refused to do it. So Jeff and Walter, seeing that if this guy, if this didn't go through, they lose their paycheck too. Um, I like an hour later you come back. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I don't know. I don't know what, what happened, but I'm back for now. Well, listen, okay. you're right in time for Pinocchio's Revenge, so just shut there up. There you go. So, <laughs> the stream has so, a death curse. So they go they go to um, uh, mark them in at Trimark, and they say, you know, okay, so we're not going to do this guy's Pinocchio script, but the idea for a killer Pinocchio, he he doesn't own that I you know idea. You can't copyright an idea. And they said, as long as our script is nothing like his, and it's a whole different story, we can do another Pinocchio. And 
Mark Amin was kind of on the fence about it. Well, uh, and they said, what if we can get Kevin? And he said, you'll never get Kevin. He, he, he's turned down two Leprechaun films. And so they said, well, let us see if we can get him. We have a relationship with him. So they call me and they say, listen, we're doing, we want to, we're going to do this Pinocchio film. It's 1.6 million. And I was like, eh. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not a really big fan of the killer puppet genre. Uh, you know, some <laughs> genre. Um, I thought child's play was entertaining, but it wasn't something I wanted to make. You know, I can enjoy a film and not want to make one myself. Right. And, right. You know, so, um, and they said, yeah, but, you know, they'll give you carte blanche. You can do what you want. So I thought about it and I said, if I can write and make it kind of like magic where you don't really know if it's the puppet or the little girl is, you know, psychologically damaged, that could interest me. And they said, okay, do that. So I did. And then Trimark goes, uh, they were looking for more of a child's play. And I said, listen, if you want me to write that, I'll write it. But then you'll have to find another director for it because I don't want to direct that. And they really wanted me more as a director than as a writer. They got me to write it because they knew that was a way to hook me in. But um, so they said, no, 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 we don't want We don't want that. We want you to direct it. And I said, OK, well, then I'm going to make this the way I want to make it and they and throughout they kept making suggestions throughout every now and then they'd say well what if this and I'd say listen guys I'm not making Leprechaun just because you're calling me Pinocchio <laughs> you know I, I turned down two Leprechaun films I'm not doing one just because we named him Pinocchio you know so um so it was a little tense because they kept trying to talk me into doing what I'd already told them up front I wasn't going to do. So, but they didn't, they never came down and really hammered me. They kind of, even though they weren't happy about it, they knew that was the agreement they made. So they honored it. So I made, and then I came back and I, I came up with the compromise. I said, listen, here's what we do. Once she gets hit in the head and sees the puppet moving, we can have an attacker, chase her down the hallways. You get all that footage for your trailers when you go to Cannes and Mifed and uh, and uh, all the other festivals. And then I can say that someone can question her, but you saw the puppet move after you got hit in the head, right? And she's like, I know what I saw. And it's like, did she though? Did she see that or did she imagine it because she was concussed? And so I got my ambiguous ending like I wanted and they got the killer puppet running around for all their trailers <laughs> which so, is a it's a good trade yeah 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 because yeah. they played the shit of that puppet moving in there in the trailer man that thing was ah! you know, everywhere that puppet was that puppet was moving. <laughs> we need a vinegar syndrome release of that me and uncle bill want to do a fan commentary over because we love that movie Really? Yeah. You guys are big fans of Pinocchio? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would, yeah. Okay, I'm, here's the here's one thing. Like like when uh, I told you about how the witchboard guys were calling me all mad because the tale had gotten changed to witch trap. Same thing here. The original script that we shot the film under was called Pinocchio Syndrome because back then um, the cyber writers were really popular, cyber novels, cyber uh, mangas, and Pinocchio Syndrome was a term that they, uh, a phrase they turned, uh, coined for um, a computer that becomes self-aware. The Pinocchio hmm. syndrome is a computer, basically like the computer uh, from like Terminator or something. So I thought, oh, that's a cool title, Pinocchio syndrome, but in our case, it's really Pinocchio. And they decided that that was too cerebral and they didn't want to call it that. So they were called, they were said, let's call it bad Pinocchio. I said, <laughs> I said, oh, my God, no. So I said, why don't we just call it Pinocchio? The ads and all, everyone will know it's a horror film. Just call it Pinocchio. <laughs> and they said, okay. So I was like, okay. And then somewhere down the road, they got the idea that, hey, I know. Even better, let's call it Pinocchio's Revenge. And I was like, that makes it sound like a sequel. Like there was a Pinocchio, and now 
Pinocchio too. Pinocchio. <laughs> it <revenge>. does. <laughs> I said, and if it's not, they watch the film and go, "Revenge for what? <laughs> what happened?" And he's, re- he's not revenging anything. He's just a psycho little puppet. Except that he's not. He's the crazy little girl, maybe. So uh, anyway, so that's how it became Pinocchio's Revenge, and I hated that title. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and I was about to raise a stink, but Mark Amin's one of his kids died. Mm. And it's like, well, what? I'm going to call him and say, sorry, your daughter died, but we got to talk about this title. So I, I just let yeah. it go. Yeah, I just let it go. Um, otherwise, I would have fought a lot harder to uh, do something with that title. Um, yeah, Pinocchio's Revenge. And that was one of those movies, too. And but we I'm talk about this. Yeah, we talk about this yeah. all the time, though. It's like, um, it was a budget DVD release back when DVDs were kind of new. Yeah. Like, um, Walmart would have like $5 DVDs or whatever. Yeah, and that yeah. was like a staple. Yeah. Um, so I think that was the first time that I'd ever seen that. The movie came out in the mid 90s, right? Is that right? Uh, well, let's put it this way. It came out on VHS first. It did not come out on DVD. It was a VHS, direct-to-video release. Yeah. So um, it got re-released by Lionsgate, who bought the Trimark Library as a DVD years later, and they just threw it out there with a bare-bones minimum. I didn't even know it was getting a DVD release until I read about it in the trades. And it's like, guys, we had all this great behind-the-scenes footage of um, uh, Mini Me trying on the Pinocchio suit and running around in it, you know, that we could have put in the behind the scenes if we had known. I could have gotten the cast and crew members together to do a commentary like I did for Witchboard, Night of the Demons, uh, Witch Trap, The Cellar. Uh, I did that for all those films. Is, um, is that movie still at Lionsgate, or do you know? I think so. I don't okay. know. So they've got their own boutique mini line that a friend of ours works on. And uh, I'll mention it to him. Michael Felcher, I don't know if you know him. Yeah, yeah, I know Michael. He does the uh, Vestron video. I mean, it's pretty much him that does all the the special features and all that for those Well, if he wants to re-release it, I'll put it all together for him. Yeah, I think that'd be perfect for that line if they still own the, the movie. Yeah, yeah. I know Vinegar Syndrome asked me about it. I said, I'd love to see that come back out on a better DVD and Blu-ray. And what I'd really love to see get released over here on DVD and or Blu-ray um, is uh, Peacemaker. Ah, uh, yeah. We had not really ever talked about that, but that that is a genre film, but it's not necessarily the horror genre. That's why it's I guess. Sci-fi action, yeah. Yeah. With with Academy Award nominee Robert Forster in the yep. lead, the first film we did together, and became lifelong friends after that. Really, I didn't know that. Oh yeah, yeah, we were really good friends after that. And then then he did uh, Demolition University, and I had to fight to get him because they wanted uh, Robert Urich, and I said no, Bobby's a stronger actor, and so they said fine, Kevin. And I cast Bobby in it. And while we were doing ADR, Bobby came in to do ADR. The trades had just announced that he was he had just gotten the lead to Jackie Brown. And I went back to the producers that made me grovel to get him. And I said, <laughs> you're, go, you're going to AFM with the, uh, uh, Tarantino's, the star of Tarantino's next film in the lead of your little action movie. You're welcome. You know? <laughs> He was one of those guys, too, that, like, I haven't really looked up his IMDb lately, but he's just in, like, everything. It seemed like he was in so much. He was in, he did a lot of TV in the golden age of TV. He was in, I mean, his first feature film, he was the third lead opposite um, Marlon Brando and Elizabeth Taylor. Oh, my God. Reflections in a Golden Eye. That was his first feature film. He did. He worked with Gregory Peck. Him and Gregory Peck became really good friends. Um, he was just. He was always. He's just a solid, solid actor, and just a genuinely, amazingly nice guy. 
Cool. So yeah. over the years, though, I mean, you haven't really, as far as you said, you've been trying to maybe get the Night of the Demons sequel, the remake, the yeah, the remake sequel. There we go. Then um, I also I had an idea for a sequel to the original trilogy too, that would basically be um, bring back the old, some of the old cast going back to the house now, uh, thirty five years later, but uh, the problem is, and I learned this doing the trying to do the sequel to the first uh, to the remake is if I don't own the property, I end up doing all this free work. And then if it falls through, at least if I write a script, a spec script, and no one buys it, I can stick it on the shelf and try again in a few years. But I own it. I can yeah. I can always try, dust it off and try again. But if I don't own the property, I did all that work for free. And then if they do get it off the ground in five years, they'll probably just go with whoever's around at the time to be the new producer, you know? So I don't really pursue doing stuff that I don't know. So when people ask me, when are you going to do another Diet of Demons? When are you going to do another witch board? I had a great idea for another witch board where, again, because we shot about 30 minutes worth of footage in the original witch board that never made it into the film. And I wanted to have it nowadays. They, they're, Todd and uh, uh, Jim and Linda are married. They have a daughter who finds a Ouija board and starts playing with it without their knowledge because she knows they completely freak out about Ouija boards and I was going to do flashbacks and I and Todd and Tawny were all up to come back and then I would have flashbacks and it would actually be Todd and Tawny from 35 years ago in flashbacks you know and uh, I'm not but you know they want but I, I couldn't get a straight answer whether they were interested or not and I'm not going to do that kind of work you know I'm just not going to put in that kind of effort for something I don't own. It's weird, though, because it seems like both those franchises have a name value to them, that they would want to do that, you know? Yeah. Like, people know what those movies are. I don't understand. Well, especially yeah. with Witchboard, as far as, like, the they had the yeah. Ouija movies that came out a few years ago. Right. Yep. That was, yep. I told them that's the time to do it while while Ouija boards are in everybody's consciousness yeah. right now, you know, they, we, we bet piggyback on their, their, uh, PR campaign, you know? Yeah. And, and now Tawny's, you know, passed away last year. So, or earlier this year. So that's it. Um, that there's that idea shot. And now, you know, and the idea I had for night of the demons, you know, if we lose somebody that that's down the toilet too, but mm -hmm. Well, you guys have done a few of the reunions at shows with, oh, yeah, with a lot yeah. of the cast. But it's not up to me or the cast. It's up to the producers who own the property. It's not even up to Joe. He doesn't own them either. Hmm. Well, I was going to ask those, like, as far as touching base with them, I mean, before these conventions, like, what was the the first show that you guys did together that you can recall? The first one I did was in new jersey i can't remember i think it was monster uh, monster mania yeah monster mania in new jersey and it was me and it wasn't even the main like it wasn't linnea or amelia it was me it was alvin alexis who played roger it was allison baron who played helen and it was jill Tereshita who played franny and it was the four of us and they had a big night of the demons vip party um, they had a big Night of the Demons cake. Um, it was great. They just, you know, they treated us like royalty. Rode back on the bus with a couple of the guys from uh, um, uh, Walking Dead, which was in its first or second season mm -hmm. because it was, it was um, uh, God, I can never pronounce his last name, Barenthal, who played Shane, who got killed, I think, in season two. Um, uh, um, the guy who played Glenn and um, the guy from uh, the Saints. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Nor Norman Reedus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and we all just sat on the bus and, well, actually, um, I chatted with uh, the guy from uh, uh, the guy who's still on the show. <laughs> I chatted <laughs> the only with one him. left. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we we chatted forever about uh, 
um, the Saints movies because my brother Dennis mixed the first one at his huh. studio. So we chatted about that for a long time. And then on the bus, I chatted a lot with the guy who played Glenn and the guy who played Shane and got to know them. And all of them were really nice guys, you know, just down to earth. Um, the show was popular, but I don't, it was, I don't know that it was a big hit that it is now, you know. Um, it was in its first or second season. But um, uh, that was great. And that's where I, you know, that was the first convention I went to. And then I didn't really do one again for a few years because I didn't have a convention agent at the time. And I wasn't sure I wanted to do them because they're exhausting. <laughs> I think yeah. making a movie is less tiring than doing it. <laughs> What's anything. crazy, though, is like a, a, a lot of the actors don't real, or maybe they're starting to realize. Yeah. So you've got a guy in the new Halloween. Have you seen the new Halloween movie, by the way? The what? The new Halloween movie that just came out. So. No. You've seen the original, though, right? From yeah, Donald yeah. Pleasance and all that. So I, the new I think I think when you're into number twenty, you know, maybe it's time to <laughs> that horse is dead. Just stop flogging. Yeah, it, you know? well, they that, got, that's definitely the case with this one. Yeah, in the new one, they have a Donald Pleasance lookalike, and they with prosthetic effects and everything. It did look it. It kind of looked like him. I thought it was yeah, CGI yeah. or something like that. But like that was maybe what twenty seconds in the movie. Yeah, Aaron, Uncle Bill. Yeah, yeah, and he is already doing conventions. So that's yeah. that's like a good side job there. He can do that for the yeah. rest of his life because yeah, that, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, it's kind of crazy. It's probably it's also a film that's part of a huge franchise that probably opened in like three or four or five thousand theaters. You know, oh, true. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. But and then, you know, you were you were asking me about the Night of the Demons remake. One of the things I did find really interesting was like you know it was a it was like a four million dollar movie with a named cast you know shannon elizabeth eddie furlong monica Keena, um you know name people especially in the genre and when i did the first night of the demons no name cast complete no name cast i was a no name director because witchboard hadn't witchboard actually came out while we were shooting night of the demons um uh but it was a film no one had heard of because we weren't we didn't realize we didn't know enough about pr yet to be promoting it getting people to come down and nobody came down and interviewed me like uh, dread central or fangoria or anything on Witchboard or night of the demons because we weren't out there announcing that we were making the films you know um so we made them and then Night of the Demons especially kind of grew by word of mouth. It would play in a regional area and do really well. And then when it came to somewhere else, people had now kind of heard of it or knew something about it. And then they went and saw it and then it built up its audience. And eventually made like three million at the box office, you know, for a film that was made for maybe a million. Um, and then um, when we did the, the remake, there was a write-up every week. Someone talking about, oh, they're in production. They'd cast every time a new cast member was land. You know, he was. A, they would announce, oh, Eddie Furlong has signed on. You know, uh, so and so, such and such. And then we opened. We were invited to open um, the Screenfest Film Festival in Hollywood, and it sold out. It was a packed audience full house um and i said it was you know we did we did the whole red carpet thing all the video magazines were out there interviewing us and i said it's strange to have done the first film in complete obscurity <laughs> and now have this thing be this huge just pr you know machine just moving yeah times have definitely changed quite a bit when yeah. it comes to, I mean, just the internet in general now, I mean, you can go, if you look hard enough on the internet, you can watch anything you want to watch. You don't have to pay anything. Yeah. It's somewhere. And then back in the day, yeah. you know, VHS rental stores, it just kind of relied on what was about, you know, what, yeah. what was, what was on well, the shelf there. I remember waiting weeks and weeks for a new film to, you know, every time you go in, it was checked out. You just have to go, yep. go every day and see if it's come in yet, you know? Um, absolutely. 
and then you had HBO and then Netflix would actually send them to you. Like, wow. You just tell them what you want. They send it to you. That's right. it, they put it in the envelope and send it back. What could be easier? Right. Oh, I don't know. Streaming. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did the red box thing there for a while, which is still yeah. kind of big here for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. Know. It really, um, it's, it's still, yeah. It, I have a lot of friends that do low budget films and they make a big deal about, Oh, we're in red box because I guess, Redbox is better about most of the money going back to the filmmakers than most other platforms. So everyone's excited when they get their film in Redbox or something. I don't know. I've never, I've never uh, dealt with that. My stuff, everything I make gets picked up by somebody. <laughs> um, Eric here's got an interesting question. Is there any new concepts or ideas that, that you maybe have on the, that you've been uh, working on or yeah actually um i actually i wrote a script for a friend originally who wanted to produce a horror film in egypt and he said so it can be scary but you can't have blood and gore so i thought well, what can i do so i kind of got the idea that it takes you know it's going to be in egypt it'll be in a um uh, a pyramid like a tomb and Kind of like the bugs, the scarabs from the uh, mummy film, the Brendan Fraser. That would be the big thing that they they don't like light. So whenever the lights start dimming, they start hearing them under the sand, scurrying, getting ready to come to the surface. And if they do, they get into you through your nose, your ear, your ass, however they can, and they basically <laughs> suck all the moisture out of your body. So you kind of become mummified from the inside out. And so I thought that's good and scary and creepy and it could be some great visual effects and yet there's no blood because at one point like one girl is they're trying to rescue her and he pulls on her and her arm comes off because it's already desiccated and it's just dust and you know comes out because there's no blood or any kind of liquid in her anymore. I said so that could be cool. Um, and then his his funding fell through, but because I had written it as a spec for him, because he didn't have money to pay me up front, um, I kept the script. And um, I came across a comic book artist who had draws, he does superheroes for Marvel and DC. And on Facebook, he had said something about, I've always wanted to do horror. So I said, hey, I got a script that would make a great comic. And he said, send it. And I sent it. He read it. And he said, yeah, so we're doing it. And we've already had just based on um, his credentials as an artist and mine in the horror genre, we've had two, he's had two publishers already interested in. We haven't even drawn anything yet where we drew a cover and that's it. Um, and but we're we're moving forward with that. So that's cool because my brother Dennis and I used to draw our own comics when we were in middle school but I was never good enough. I knew I was never going to be a professional artist. So it's kind of cool that I still might be able to do a professional comic. So anyway, um, we're drawing, he, he's drawing that now and hopefully it'll be ready like in a year or so. Um, uh, so I'm working on that and uh, some other things I have, uh, I'm working on an, uh, an anthology, uh, um, an anthology film uh, set on Halloween. So, so I'm I'm in the uh, stages of writing that script now, um, but you know I write the script and I got to find someone to fund it. So, yeah. I'm, about, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say that the anthology thing is probably one of my favorite subgenres of. Of, Every time uh, I come close, I, I got hired to do an anthology that ended up not going, and the fans just went nuts. Oh, yay! We've always wanted to see an anthology from you. And they, so that's what gave me the idea. I'll just write my own, and then I don't have to worry about, you know, yeah. someone else owning the rights to it. I mean, they're, they're, they're fun, the creep show thing. I think Trick mm -hmm. or Treat was amazing when it came out. It's been well, that's, 13, what, that's kind of what I want to mirror. I want to mirror where it's an anthology, but mm -hmm. you don't have a bookend guide telling you three stories or something. I want them to actually intermingle that they're all happening on the same night. And you just, you're on one story and then maybe a character from this one 
crosses through this story and then when this story is done you go on to another story and there's the guy who was just an extra in that story is now the lead in this story there's another one that's uh underrated i don't know if you i think screen factory um i think it was a showtime movie back in the early 90s called body bags did you ever check that one out john carpenter yeah i did i didn't really i don't remember it really to tell you the truth it was so oh, yeah. long ago that i barely have any memory of it i kind of just remember the stacy keach I one the, is one i thought that, the, i thought the stories were weak the one with i think the one with stacy keach with the hair right <laughs> I, you were gonna say that's I always favorite. yeah yeah <laughs> i kind of like that and then they I, had the one with the mark hamill and the eye like they were all kind of basic I don't stories, remember that. But, yeah. 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 One of the things I want to do is not do those kind of stories. I want to do. <laughs> well, no, no, I, mean, I mean, not something. It's They're not going to be like, oh, I've seen this before. Or, oh, I know where this, or, you know, they're, they're more, um, I guess they're more me. They're kind of a witch boardy night of the demons cross, so to speak, you know. But yeah, they're more me. I'm telling you, um, uh, Sam Raimi and I, he took me to lunch once and we were talking. And this was a long time ago. I think I, I think I was working on Night of the Demons and he was working on um, Darkman at the time. And he had a horror script that was like gothic horror and he wanted to talk to me about directing it because he'd like, Witchboard, which was character driven as opposed to his film, uh, which was not. And he was talking about how he wasn't really a horror fan before he made that. And I wasn't really a horror fan before I did Witchboard Night of the Demons. And I see all these low budget horror films. And now with DVD, you can listen to the commentary. And they're always talking, and a scene comes up, and the guy will go, Oh, this is my homage to the Romero scene. And it's like, Well, that's why your film sucks. It's a bunch of homages <laughs> yeah. to somebody, another film that was better than yours. I say, if you're going to steal something from another film, you better you better at least make it your own. And hopefully you're doing it. You did it better. You say, oh, I see what they did there. But if they'd done this, it would have been better. That's great. But if you're just basically recreating the scene and sticking it in your film, your film now has no plot. It's just a bunch of homages stuck together. I really feel... Uh, the people who were not necessarily super horror fans tend to be the ones that bring something new to the genre. You know, um, Wes Craven. I mean, you know, well, his first film, Last House on the Left, was Virgin Spring, an Ingemar Bergman movie. It was like a total ripoff of Ingemar Bergman's uh, The Virgin Spring. Um, so, you know, because he knew other films than just horror. I had dinner a few years ago with a bunch of my uh, colleagues in the horror genre, and I would mention films in passing that were not horror, and they'd never even heard of them, let alone had seen them. And I was just stunned, you know? It's like, wow, really? You've never seen this? You've never even heard of it? Um, and I think that's kind of why maybe horror has in some ways gotten stale i think i think a lot of blumhouse's films are good because jason blumhouse actually seems to have a filmmaker's mind and seems to actually give a damn about the genre but so many other guys they either they're either studio suits who are just making a sequel to something for the bucks you know hey let's make a quick buck off of this or their their fans who are so fan so involved in their fandom that they can't they can't really be creative they can only mirror what what they saw and what they liked when they were growing up which is great it's great to use that as a stepping stone or a, a jumping off point like oh when i saw a horror film this scared me so i want to do something that's that scary that reaches that same fear that I that that this film over here put into me um, 
but if you're just copying it, that's what it is. It's a copy. I mean, I think that's I think that's exactly right. I think the guys that make the most effective films really aren't like making a horror film, or that that's not their reference point. Like you take William Freakin to me is a perfect example. Like coming from a documentary, you know, style and making the French Connection, and then goes in and makes the Exorcist. Like he wasn't looking to make. He he didn't care about you know yeah. the horror genre at that time as much as he was just making like a solid kind of film like yeah a, uh, and, and it's still probably one of the best if not the best horror film ever made yeah and and, and i always say and that's a qualifier because it's not only a great horror film it's just a great film yeah mm -hmm. and you're right it's because he shot everything so realistically that it was so much easier to get sucked in and believe what you were seeing on screen was real you know yep Blumhouse is actually remaking The Exorcist while they're oh, doing that, the trilogy. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> that's tough. That's a tough one to remake, man. Like, yeah, oh, yeah. God. Yeah. I think that, I'm surprised this took this long, though, because they've remade everything at this point, really. Did you, see the, did you see the Omen remake? Yes. Yep. It wasn't bad. It was just... It just didn't capture anything that I mean, the first one captured. It was... No. It was okay to sit. There's a few of them like this. Okay to sit through once, like the Amityville remake was the same way. Yeah, Amityville yeah. Remake. But I've never rewatched it. I've never wanted to rewatch yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, me neither. You know? Yeah, I agree. And uh, and and I think sometimes it's because they, I don't even know. I think they just all. It's like, why is the best Superman film ever made the one that was made in 1973? Why or seventy six? Why can't they make another good Superman film? Because they're all trying to be dark. Because Bat the Batman trilogy was so successful. Oh, we need dark superheroes. Superman isn't, wasn't, and never should be dark. Captain America isn't dark. You know, you got wow. you got Tony Stark with all his darkness. But it's a great it, it's great to bounce that off of the uh, boisterous constant uh optimism of captain america captain america is what superman should be you know i just think with the yeah, with true. the superhero movies they're too busy remaking them over and over again every couple of years like well dc yeah it's like it's like listen i went to film school with guys who were like i came in as a junior and they were working on their grad film cutting it reshooting stuff and then i made my undergrad film i made my grad film i graduated i left and that guy was still in the editor room cutting <laughs> him it's Jeez. like you know take what you learn from it and move on instead of trying to constantly go back and remake and fix and then you get stuck you get stuck in there and i think that's what dc every every they go oh this didn't work let's reboot it it's like well why don't you figure out why it didn't work and make a sequel that's better than the original Make Godfather 2, you know? There was, um, I'm not going to name names because people can, it's fun for them to guess who I'm talking about, but there's another <laughs> filmmaker from around the time when the movies that you made came out, and there's a documentary about one of those movies that he made, and it almost seems like he's bitter at this point that that is the only movie that he's really going to be known as the, you know, that's what he did. I think yeah. he wanted to do more. Yeah. Would you say that you're fine with people, ah, oh, it's Kevin Tenney, Night of the Demons, Witchboard? Or do you well, want more? There was there was a movie on Showtime, one of Paul Newman's last films. And he plays this, you know, the, he, he's lived his entire life in this small town. He knows everybody because they're all, they all born, went to school there, got jobs there, and will die there. And um, it's a small, like, New England town. And at one point, he's talking to a gal that I guess they used to date in high school and now they're friends because they've known each other since they were like in second grade. And she's kind of feeling melancholy. And at one point, she's, you know, she's feeling like her mortality is creeping up on her and she feels like she hasn't really done anything. And she says to him, she goes, well, I don't know, you seem so well adjusted. She goes, don't you ever, don't you ever sometimes just wish for more? And he says, nobody ever wishes for less. <laughs> That's and true. Like, oh, my God. That 
that one line encapsulates life in general. It's true. Yep. It doesn't matter who you are. You kind of want more. Yeah, sure. I mean, I feel like to a much lesser degree, like, um, uh, I, you know, Witchboard was, or Night of the Demons was my um, Citizen Kane. And that's it, you know. I did it when I was 20. I did Witchboard in my 20s. And um, I've done films I think are better since, but they've never gotten the kind of uh, attention that <coughs> the Night of the Demons got. And uh, excuse yourself. Don't cough over me when I'm talking. Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm kidding you. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just, uh, so sure, what I like, but it's not, I don't mind being remembered for it. I just wish I had the opportunity to do some other stuff that had gotten wider releases and maybe more of the public had seen. I really, I did a neo-noir film called TikTok that I personally is one of my favorites and most of my horror audience never heard of it. Um, a lot of them maybe have heard of Peacemaker, but they've never seen it. And those are two of my best films, in my opinion. My family film, Bigfoot, which I had not, I did not have high hopes for when I took it on, um, turned out to be uh, one that I really was happy with when it was done. I'm really happy with that film, too. But none of them got the kind of, you know, exposure. But I think that's also, if you notice, I just named three non-horror films. Mm -hmm. The horror audience is much more focused and organized than just your general movie audience. There are horror fans will see everything that comes out that's horror. So maybe if I did another horror film, I would get the same kind of notice because all the horror fans would go, yay, another horror film. Let's go see, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? A, yeah. It's so true, though, that for some reason, like the horror genre, like the fans are much more dedicated yeah. to those movies than any other like genre of film. So absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, um, I definitely, and I, so I'm not going to be like bummed that I've got fans in the horror community because of which board, which trap night of the demons and the cellar. It's like, and Pinocchio's revenge. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, that's fine. And, you know, Pinocchio's Revenge is a perfect example of a script I would not have written had I not been hired to do it. Mm. But, I, but again, the film turned out a lot better than I thought it would. I was, uh, I was, at the end of the day, I was happy with it. And, um, you know, for a script I would never have written as a spec script, I was, I was very happy with the way it turned out and the way that your film turned out. I think we need to get with uh, Michael Felcher and get that Blu-ray done. See if we there can, you go. See if we get, can't get that out. Get get whop him upside the noggin. <laughs> Say, get to work. <laughs> I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah. I haven't seen him in person in a little, in a few years, but I would. Yeah. Well, reach out. Reach out through the phone line and whack. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, I appreciate you taking all this time. A lot of which we were trying to figure out what in the hell was going on with everybody's <laughs> internet. Yeah, I think but, we had like every technical difficulty that you could have. Like, you went away for an hour. Dennis went away in the very beginning. I don't. I, yeah. Yeah, he never came back. So they, he, I mean, obviously you guys were having issues because after his popped off, we all popped off. But I think he was having issues on top of the ones you were having. So yeah. That's so weird. But it's weird that he was talking to you before we went live, and there was no problem. It was. It was fine. Yeah, yeah was I so, don't know what. So the strange. Heck. But yeah, maybe we can we can get some technical issues resolved and uh, you know Try have you guys again. back back on yeah. at some point. But it's been a great conversation. What we did get uh, get to talk about and um, yeah, keep us yeah, up to date on some future projects and stuff too. Yeah. Because I think that uh, I was looking today, Brain Dead is out on came out on Blu Ray right recently. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, it came out this year. What? Brand oh, I thought it. No, it, it, not on Blu ray. It came out on um, DVD like years of 10 years ago or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I saw the Blu ray. I thought there was a Blu ray out of it or something. So. Uh, brain Dead? No. Not my Brain Dead. Maybe um, the old one made by. Uh, I'll, 
I think it was yours. I'll send you a link. It's probably a bootleg, though. Yeah, it, yeah. Must, it probably is. Then. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that'd be a cool one, then, if that's not got official release for, you know, yeah, Vinegar Syndrome great, or I'd Scream love to Factory. See that. I'd love yeah. to see that released on Blu-ray. I'd love to... Um, uh, Peacemaker, I would really love to see on DVD, Blu-ray, especially now that Robert's gone, because it was one of his personal favorites, too. So... Um, but it's wall to wall action. It got it's the only film I ever did that got a great review in Variety and Hollywood Reporter, the two major trade papers. Um, I had other films that got great reviews in Variety and then Hollywood Reporter didn't like it or vice versa, but that's the only film I ever did that both uh, magazines gave great reviews to. And Joe Bob well, named Joe Bob Briggs named it one of the top ten films of the year it was released. Oh wow! Wow, yeah, he's kind of made a comeback as well he recently. Yeah, 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 yeah. Everything old is new again. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I mean, you can get cassette tapes except, and except new for my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Those never get old. Yeah, you know. Well, now, now I've graduated to dad jokes because I'm officially old enough to be telling dad jokes. Now. <laughs> you know how you can tell a dad joke from a regular joke, right? Huh. It's apparent. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. That's pretty perfect. That's a pretty perfect dad joke. That's yeah. the ultimate dad joke. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we thank you for taking the time out again. Absolutely. Um, and, um, yeah, keep us up to date. Hopefully, uh, I'll aggravate uh, Felcher and be like, hey, they've got that shit at Lionsgate. See what well, we if, Aaron, if Aaron was on Facebook, maybe, you know. And you are on Facebook. How do you keep missing this stuff? I post about it all the time. I posted the cover of the comic. I posted uh, um, about the different conventions I've been going to. I here's he don't thing. he don't pay attention to nothing but himself. If it's got <laughs> him in it, I, get, I, and, I like I like his posts all the time. He never yep. does shit on mine. <laughs> That's how he is. <laughs> Selfish. It's a one sided relationship. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Now, the, the convention you're, thing, you're, like I, you're one I, of those people. My my therapist says I should cut out of my. <laughs> <laughs> He's toxic. He's a toxic friend. I am bad right for yeah. I, I don't like a lot on uh, Facebook at all. I've, I've never done that for some reason. Need to need to change that. But uh, yes, you do. Yes, but uh, all right. Well, we appreciate you taking the time Absolutely. out again, though, and. Yeah. Uh, we would well, like love said, to get you. Guys you. Were, you guys were my first podcast interview way back when. It probably yeah. wasn't podcast. Probably wasn't even a word then. Like we didn't we didn't call it a podcast. It was horror no. talk radio back then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't on the radio. <laughs> it was. It was. Yeah, we, like to con- radio. we like to convince I've, people it was. So. And I say this all the time. I'm like, this is how <laughs> we got those interviews. Like, because yeah. now you know, people, everybody's got a podcast. Oh, yeah. I know. I get I get three or four requests a day. It's like, hey guys, I know I'm like kind of semi retired, but I don't want to spend <laughs> every day all day talking about the same right. movies over. And over. <laughs> Especially now that we've done these documentaries, I tell people, you want to know about Night of the Demons? Get the Blu-ray and watch the. Do- <laughs> it's a it's a seventy five minute documentary with everything you could possibly ever want to know. You need to get an affiliate link. That way, you can just send them the link and make a little bit of money on the a little yeah, bit more money. Yeah. On the Blu-ray. Not to mention, Night of the Demons. By the time we did the four K, we we've, we've now done. I've done three commentary tracks with different cast and crew every time. So you eventually got almost everyone <laughs> in the commentaries talking about different stuff and, uh, and two commentaries on night of, on which board and who knows, you know, not even, not, and that's not even counting the big night of the demons documentary they're doing. That's encompassing all four films, you know? Hmm. Yeah. There's, there's still work. That's been a long time in the making, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I posted something, poking at them about it you know and so man they they uh was that was like got, a fan uh yeah yeah they got upset because they thought i was like you know insulting <laughs> them and i was like i'm teasing you guys you know i'm teasing you but i said something that i think um like a the latest bond film got made in less time or something <laughs> And they're like, hey, we have to do this and we have to. And I was like, guys, guys, calm down. I was kidding. You know, I was joking. 
Um, <laughs> the truth but, yeah. is, though, like there's the, the documentary well, the, stuff the now. Pandemic, the pandemic came up right in the middle of the interview, so that kind of. Well, there's some companies that's just making documentaries on Zoom, right? I think Severin had like a documentary on anthologies. They recorded that on Zoom. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, the documentary thing is kind of crazy. They've got these yeah, yeah. in search of Crystal ones Lake that are memory. like three, yeah. they're like three or four hours long. And I'm like, I just don't have time. I mean, I'm not, I'm in Eastern Kentucky. <laughs> I realize that I've. I've probably got time to kill, but I just can't focus on something for four hours. <laughs> Five hours long, yeah. You know. Yeah. But when anyway. You, yeah, when are you going to find the time to go out and shoot a squirrel? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, I've got other things. Uh, he, really don't sh- he don't shoot them. He strangles them to death with his bare hands. He just jumps on top of them. Because he's, yeah. man- he's a manly man. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. God. Hor- he-, he strangles and says, that's horror talk radio, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call it a podcast. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that's what it was though back in the day. People were like, "Oh, it's it's on the radio. I want to do it." So we got yeah, a lot more I interviews think, back then. That's how it worked. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I just figured you guys had gone to the trouble to track me down. Now I, you know, now it's like I when someone tracks me down, I get creeped out. Like, uh oh. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's now it's like there's there's some crazy people out. I mean, well, not yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we don't want to open that can of worms. No. But <laughs> I've heard all, all kinds we got of a whole like. Other show there. <laughs> like back in the day, Adrian King uh, with from Friday the Thirteenth, like had serious like life threatening issues yeah, with the yeah. stalker. And yeah. I think Danielle Harris did too. I've I've heard over the years. Well, yeah, and the problem is. Some people, when you're nice to them, they now imagine that you guys have this whole relationship in their head, you know, that they think is real. And it's like, you know, I said hi to you because you're a fan the same way I said hi to those 20 fans over there, you know. So, uh, but at least I'm a, I'm behind the camera and I'm six foot three, so... It's not quite the same. <laughs> That's true. Some, I mean, yeah. it's probably stalkers. Yeah, for Daniel Harris, is a little bit different than yeah, like exactly. if Dead Pit had stalkers, it would just be like a, <laughs> it would be some dude that would want to talk about something that happened on show forty seven back in two thousand eight <laughs> yeah. or something like yeah, that. Exactly, like a Rain I, Man I, top. I imagine my stalker would be too lazy to actually get up from his computer he would just stop me on <laughs> he'd just send you message, he's like, message. Oh, he, oh he's he's down the street at that convention uh now i'm going to have a twinkie and watch this <laughs> <laughs> so you know I, 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 my brother dennis used to say about his music because i because his band was really good and they never got a record deal and i was just floored because other bands i didn't think were as good and I said, I don't get it, man. Everyone loves, you know, whenever they play a club, they would like just so, you know, they sell it out. And he said something that stuck with me. He said, my problem is my music appeals to absolutely everybody who can do me no good. <laughs> 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 and I feel the same way. It's like I have other directors come up to me and say, I love your stuff, man. And the, the way you did that or, you know, how'd you do that mirror scene or that car chase or whatever. But never a producer. The guy who could actually hire me never comes <laughs> over. Because right. they don't know enough about filmmaking to understand what I did. But other filmmakers are like, wow, that was cool, you know. But they can't hire me because we're competing for the same job, <laughs> you know. Yeah. That's a great quote, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> no, I, know. I, I use it all the time. <laughs> the music appeals to everybody who can do me no good. <laughs> But yeah, hopefully we can get Dennis back on and get you guys together yeah. at some yeah. point. We can do a Night of the Tennies two, maybe or one and a half, <laughs> one point five. Yeah, yeah, because you know it was kind of a knot of not of the tinny, pretty much tonight. Yeah, it can be ten, tenny two, <laughs> one zero e two, like a, like it's an element. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right, but yeah, you have a good night, and you too. Uh, it's always great talking yeah, with yeah, you yeah. good to see you man hopefully we'll yeah. meet up at a convention a or something yeah 
down the well, line. I, I'm nowhere near Louisville. I know that you sent me a message a while back. You were in Louisville, but yeah, yeah. it's like three and a half hours for me. Oh, I'm in the mountains. <laughs> yeah, oh. yeah. A little yeah. shack up in the, the hills. The buggy won't go that far. <laughs> no. <laughs> the horse threw a shoe. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, three God. and a half hours. Jeez. We're He's three got and a half hours from the nearest town. It's not counting Louisville. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, I've waited three and a half hours for a meal. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, no. which you mentioned. I would be really pissed. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. But yeah, you have a good night and uh, we yeah, thank yeah. you so much for taking all this time. Okay. Yeah, absolutely, guys. It was great seeing you again. All right. Great seeing you and appreciate everybody checking the show out. Check us out. Um, I guess it'll be November 1st. Are you doing anything, Uncle Bill, uh, for the rest of the month? I'm not really sure. You're doing the... <laughs> I, I don't really Argent, The Argento thing, maybe. But uh, if not, everybody have a happy Halloween. And uh, we will catch you in November over at deadpit.com. Give us the thumbs up. Up your butts. Like, subscribe. And if you subscribe, here's something else you can do. Once you subscribe, you can click the bell notification, right? And it'll notify you anytime that Dead Pit puts up new shit. Or don't. I really don't give a if you do. Or I don't. want you to. I want you to. <laughs> I don't let's, care. Let's keep our community growing here on I, YouTube. I don't, I don't like it. I don't want you to touch nothing. Listen, they need to do that, pal. No, don't you yeah. dare touch it. Thumbs up subscribe and click that bell thank you to all of our supporters on patreon dead pit on patreon.com is the only place to check out a complete archive of the old dead pit radio shows all the way back from 2005 on in addition to the midweek shows and fan commentaries exclusive podcasts and much more dead pit on patreon.com if you're interested Tears started only one dollar.